but it's gonna be out on the lawn beside the fellowship hall. So you can walk down the hallway all the way out to the fellowship hall or go out the side and walk down the side of the church all the way over there. And let's enjoy doing that and getting to meet Drew and Brittany. So we're finishing up Romans chapter eight today, <clears throat> which is a glorious chapter. When I began this series several weeks back, I said how I think it's one of the best chapters in all of scripture. I think I'd be hard pressed to try to choose a single absolute best. But this one is definitely up there in the top contenders. And we've seen how it is all about life in the spirit, how the spirit enables us to live this Christian life. We've seen how we are free in the spirit, how we are empowered by the spirit, persuading us and witnessing to us that we are children of God and how we are able to wait and suffer in this world by the work of the spirit. Now the cross is always still at the center of all of this because of course it's the spirit's main job to bring the truth of scripture and all that Jesus has done for us down deep into our hearts so that it actually becomes real to us. That's how he strengthens us. So today we're gonna finish with the end of this passage which is the climax of this beautiful part of scripture. So let's go ahead and read it, verses 31 to 39. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for these beautiful truths that we have sung about, that we have confessed about, and now we get to hear from your word. Lord, I pray that by the power and work of the Holy Spirit, you would work them into our hearts, persuade us of their truth, so that we might be strengthened in him. In Christ's name, amen. So back in June, we had the pleasure of having summer Bible camp here at the church, where we had many dozens of, of young kids come and learn about the love of Jesus through crafts and songs and snacks and games, and of course, Bible times. And I had the pleasure of being able to teach those Bible times, which is really fun and rewarding. And often in those with the youngest kids, I'll usually read the Bible story from a good children's Bible, like the Jesus Storybook Bible or the Gospel Story Bible, both of which have really great Christ-centered summaries of, of, the, of the stories in Scripture. And particularly, I, I really like the way the Jesus Storybook Bible summarizes the fall of Adam and Eve from their creative perfection into sin. In fact, that's the very first story we used this past summer at Summer Bible Camp from the first day. And it kept coming back to my mind over and over again as I was preparing for this sermon. Now, it's a summary for children, so of course there are theological depths to the biblical account that the story doesn't bring out. Yet what it does do really well is show us how Satan got Adam and Eve to doubt God's love for them. Even though they were in this garden all around them that he had made for them. In essence, the, the, the snake whispers into their ears, does God really love you and care for you? You see, right from the beginning, the devil is driving a wedge between God and Adam and Eve and getting them to doubt his love and so they wouldn't be persuaded of his great love for them. And then the Jesus Storybook Bible goes on to narrate. It says, the snake's words hissed into her ears and sunk down deep into her heart like a poison. Does God love me? Eve wondered. Suddenly, she didn't know anymore. Then after she eats the fruit and gives it to Adam for him to eat, the story goes on to give us one of the major implications of that for all of us, of that sin for all of us. It says, and the terrible lie came into the world 
It would never leave. It would live on every human heart, whispering to every one of God's children, God doesn't love me. And we still hear that lie today, church family. When our circumstances turn sour or unbearable, when we struggle with our own sinfulness, when we're hit by tragedy, when we feel like we're suffering for the sake of Christ, and when we just don't understand the evil going on around us and we lament it, kind of like we heard David do earlier, that lie rears its evil head again. And if Satan was so successful with Adam and Eve, with that lie and the glorious perfection of the garden, then how much more is he going to be successful with us, right? Well, Paul is challenging that lie in our passage for today. What shall we say to these things, he says? And that's a reference certainly to what he's already said in Romans chapter 8 about the Spirit's work in our life. But it really goes, it's more than that. It's bigger than that. The these things encompasses everything Paul says all the way back to chapter 1, verse 16, where he introduces the gospel. And so he's asking the question, how are we to think about these things? How should they impact us? How should we dwell on them, discuss them together, and respond to them? And then he shows us how with three who questions, which I think are primarily about the attacks of the devil on us, that us where he assaults our faith and our assurance with this age-old lie. There are three places that Paul shows us where the devil attacks us. Our circumstances in verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that one. Our sinfulness, verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? And then our relationship with God in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So let's look at the circumstances that often tempt us to believe that age-old lie. You see, the devil loves to use our circumstances to try to get us to doubt that God really will be for us all the time, that his plan is certain and always good, like Paul said back in verses 28 to 30. I mean, because sometimes we look around and we wonder if really God is working because it doesn't always look that way to us. When our children are struggling or injured or seem beyond our help, when someone that should love us is a constant thorn in our sides, when our life is not at all gone the way that we thought it would or dreamed that it would, or when we just can't make sense of all the stuff that's going on in our country or in the world, we, we think that. When that kind of stuff happens, we just can't help but think, God, are you actually really, truly, completely for your people? Can I really trust your work here with this thing that keeps me awake at night? And the devil loves to throw gasoline on those little flames of doubt. And Paul's answer here is so good. This actually is my favorite verse in the Bible. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In that short verse, Paul points us to God's great love for us and his constant gracious work in our lives. Now, Paul doesn't actually mention God's love here, yes, but it's there and how Paul brings out that it is God who gave Christ for us. Who's doing the action here is so important. God is the one doing the giving. You see, I think sometimes we're tempted to think or we know that Jesus loves us, but we're tempted to believe that the Father loves us only grudgingly. You know, like, because, because Jesus does, and he died on the cross for our sins, so then, you know, the Father now kind of has to. I think we kind of view him like that, that grumpy and snobby in-law who puts up with us because we're married to our spouse, but if we weren't married to them, they would have nothing to do with us. But that's not what Paul highlights here. He highlights not the love of Christ here, but the love of the Father in giving the Son he loved us so much before we were even lovable that he did not spare his son, his only son, but gave him for us. And that, that word spare there is, is deep and telling. There is no bit of punishment or wrath that God the Father spared Jesus from enduring. Think about the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. So, so Abraham is, did not, was willing not to spare Isaac in obedience to God but God did spare him. In that story, God repeatedly refers to Isaac as your son, your only son, whom you love. And Abraham, for the greater love of God, was 
willing to sacrifice Isaac. But in the end, he didn't have to. God stopped his hand right before the knife came down. Yet there was no one to stop God's hand. And he didn't spare his son, his only son, whom he loves from any bit of the wrath that we deserve. So think about that. The father gave Jesus and sacrificed Jesus. He put him forward, as Paul says back in chapter 3, verse 25. So yes, it, it, it was for our sins. And yes, it was in the terms of secondary causes, the result of, the direct result of the Jewish leader's assault on him and Pilate's cowardice. But ultimately, it was God who didn't spare him. And God who gave him as the sacrifice. The Father loves us that much. It is not just that the Son loves us freely. The Father does too in giving his Son, his only Son, whom he loves, to be the sacrifice for us. As a former professor of mine once wrote, <clears throat> when we look at the cross, it almost seems as though the Father loves us more than he loves his own Son. That cannot be, of course, but it looks like that. He loves us that much. No greater evidence of, God, of the Father's love for us is imaginable or necessary. He loves us that much, and the cross is the certain proof of that love. So then when the Spirit begins to work that deep into us, we'll sing something like, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, gave him to die, I scarce can take it in. And because of that great love, why would we doubt that he is for us, really for us all the time? I mean, that's Paul's answer here. He looks at that truth and he says, look, if he didn't spare Jesus, well then, of course, with Jesus, he's going to give you all these other good things. It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If, God gave the great, if God's love includes the greatest sacrifice and gift that could ever be given, well then, of course, all the lesser good things are going to get thrown in there too. Now, the all things here is not everything that we might want or pray for or desire. It's the all things of Romans 8, 28 that he's just said a few verses earlier. The all things that God works together for our good. But that's precisely why no one and nothing can ever be against us. If the sovereign God loves us this much, then there's no foe that can possibly, possibly stop his plan. That's why we read from Psalm 56 earlier. There, David is running from the bloodthirsty Saul. He's captured by the Philistines, so he's surrounded by enemies. And yet he writes, what can flesh do to me? This I know that God is for me. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And the answer is, of course, nothing. No one can truly be against us, not the devil, not any person in this world, not even our own sinful selves. Anything thrown at us with the aim of truly harming us, God redirects and then reworks for our good. So no matter the malicious intentions on anyone's part, no, nothing can truly succeed against us. It's like we sang earlier, that soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Paul is saying that because of these great things, we do not have to worry about our circumstances or anyone being against us. And, and, and Paul had, experience, had a lot of experience in that area, far more enemies than any of us have. Let them do their worst, he's saying, but they can't really be against you because God is really for you. So if your circumstances or your feelings tend to make you think or wonder if God really is for you in all this, then it, remember, it's just that original lie of the serpent raising its head again. So look to the cross. Speak that truth to yourself and then pray and ask that the Holy Spirit will make it real to your soul. Yet there's another area where the devil attacks us and again repeats this age-old lie of his, and it's in our sinfulness. Paul addresses that in 33 and 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? Because you see, the thing is, there's so many accusations that come against us every day. 
whether they're from people around us who we think we can trust or societal expectations, our own self-critical hearts or the devil just whispering in our ears, all of those things would condemn us and have us think, surely I have sinned one time too many. I'm not worthy and God is finally fed up with me. And, and you know, that, that actually could make sense with every other person in existence, right? I mean, as much as we would like to say as, as parents or as spouses that we will never abandon our children, our husbands or wives, it, it could actually happen. We are that changeable. They might just do something that disgusts us so much that we can't even look at them anymore. Or we might commit some great sin or go insane or have amnesia or something like that and bail on them. Really, any human relationship has its limits. And so we wonder, could that be the same with God? Could there be something that could come to light that would make him change his mind about us? And oh, how the devil and our own sinful selves loves to bring up the lie in that way. They accuse us of the worst sins, and they might even be true. So we have to, you know, they might even be something that we've really done or thought. We need to admit that. But then the implication of the accusation goes on to imply that unless we get to a higher level of goodness, that the God, our, our, our status of God's beloved children is, is tenuous, it might actually change. Yet Paul comes back and he says, no, no. Because of all of this great stuff that I've just told you about what God has done through Christ by the work of the Spirit, that can't be, ever, cannot be. On Monday in our session meeting, I used this passage as the devotional for the elders and the guests and the staff who were all there at the meeting. And we had a really great discussion about it, some really good comments, especially, especially here. And by the way, that's that's, that's one of the things that, about how our, how our church works. I'm the one who gets to stay up here, or, Paul, or, or Pastor Chris gets to be up here, and we get to say these things, but a lot of it comes from our interactions with all of you, of the wisdom that you give us through all sorts of different things. And on Monday, David Poti pointed out that these two questions have a slightly different emphasis and answers. In the first one, who can bring a charge? Well, really, the answer is only God himself, at least a, a valid charge. And yet he's the very one who justifies us in Jesus. Or in the second question, who, is, who can condemn? That's the authority given to Jesus. For, for the God has made him the final judge who will sit in judgment over all one day. And yet he is the very one who already took the judgment and the punishment for us. That's why we confessed from the Heidelberg earlier, that little line that says we can, quote, confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in our place. So the only ones who could bring a valid charge or pronounce judgment on us, they are both for us completely. The devil might whisper those things in our ears, reminding us of our worst sins and beating us down for those, but they cannot be validly brought against us anymore. Carvel Holton pointed out that that word for charge means a valid legal charge, and there are no valid legal charges left anymore in this, in, in this courtroom because anything that the devil might accuse us of, our own self-critical hearts might accuse us of, which may even be true, they are inadmissible in this courtroom because you see any charge, any debt has already been fully poured out and paid for by Christ. Since God did not spare his son, the wrath for my sins and yours, if you have looked to him in faith, the wrath that they deserve has already been poured out on Jesus as our substitute. So the, the charges aren't valid anymore. Carvel said it to me in an email later in, in alluding to Psalm 103. He said, we are separated from the charges as far as the east is from the west. Those cannot be validly brought up anymore. Not now, not tomorrow, not in the final judgment. That's why Paul brings up Jesus as, our, as saying he's interceding for us here. That's another legal term for what a lawyer does. But he's not pleading for mercy. You don't need a lawyer for that. He's making the case. He's pointing to his own work, making the case that the wrath has already been fully poured out on him completely. Now, it's not that the Father somehow forgets that. 
and needs to be reminded of it. Paul's just painting a picture for us of a courtroom here to give us more assurance of this truth. Because Christ is there, nothing, never can any condemnation or even a valid charge be leveled against us again. It's all inadmissible because it's all fully paid for by him. So we can challenge our own hearts and, or the devil when they, would, when they would condemn us and we can look at him and say, yeah, yeah, you're right, that's true of me. And it's actually a lot worse than you think it is. But look at that cross, it's already paid for. Like we sang earlier, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Don't let the original lie get traction in your heart because of your sinfulness. Look, you're all really that sinful. Trust me, I, I know it about some of you, and some of you know it about me. But it's all inadmissible in the heavenly courtroom for those who look to Jesus in faith. So look to the cross, speak that truth to yourself, and then pray that the Spirit will make it real to your soul. Finally, Paul goes on to talk about God's love directly for us. He's, he's exposed the devil's lies in our circumstances and the devil's lies about our own sinfulness. Now he goes right to the heart of the matter, God's love for us as our Father. Now, yes, it starts out with the love of Christ. You know, we can't be separated from that. But then look at the end. It ends with the love of God in Christ. So it's all covered. And Paul spends most of his time here probably because this is the crux of what we doubt the most. It's the heart of the original lie. It, again, as, as Doug Bowman said on Sunday we, or Monday, we might be clear about the facts, but our hearts sometimes are still are not persuaded of his great love for us. You, know, so you see, I think that there's this, um, there's this thought that creeps its way into our minds and then works its way down into our hearts, and the devil loves to use this thought with his age-old lie. It's the thought that since we are children of the king of the universe, surely, certainly, there must be some bad things that will never happen to us. Indeed, could never happen to us, right? I mean, we must be exempt from some hardship and tragedy, right? Paul's saying that's not true. And if we naively think that thought, then when those things start to happen to us, we'll start to wonder what's going on, and if God really loves us. Paul actually comes back and tells us lots of bad things that can certainly happen to us because they did happen to him. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, the sword. He had been through all of those things. And then he quotes from the Old Testament from Psalm 44 just to remind us that God's people have always been in this boat. It's always been this way. And we've got to come to grips with that, church family. We are not exempt from any hardship, sinfulness, um, disability, mental challenge, emotional challenge, biochemical challenge, tragedy, no. Yet Paul is saying none of that can separate you from God's love for you. Oh, the devil loves to use those things to try to dislodge our sense of God's love for us. But Paul is saying that is a lie from the pit of hell and it smells like smoke. Nothing in existence can separate you from God's love. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that little loved us part, past tense there, that's, that's the key. Because you see, in the first question, Paul points us outside ourselves to the heavenly Father's love for us in sending Jesus. In the second question, he points us outside ourselves to Jesus' full payment of our debt. And then here again, he points us outside ourselves to the cross itself. Because loved there is, is past tense, if you notice, or if you were reading in the Greek, aorist tense, because it's referring to the completed work of Christ on the cross. When he died on the cross and took the full punishment our sins deserve, then he didn't just achieve the mere possibility of salvation. He made it absolutely certain for God's people. And then as a result of that certain salvation, one day the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ he heals our hearts, he washes us clean, and makes us children of God forever. And so after that, forever, we are always united to Christ by the Spirit in a union that cannot be broken, ever. And since it can't be broken, God's love for us can never, ever change. And so he goes on in verses 38 and 39 to give a fairly comprehensive list of those things that cannot separate us 
from the love of God, nothing in life, nothing in death, no angel, no ruler, nothing that's happening now, nothing that will ever happen, no power, nothing from above, nothing from below. And then just in case we might come up with some kind of random what if question, nor anything else in all of creation. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns to call me home. Here in the power of Christ, I stand. And that list includes you, by the way. Because if you have truly put your faith in Christ, then even you can't separate yourself from his love. So the age-old lie of the devil, God doesn't love me, is utterly false. Utterly false. That's why Paul begins this beautiful chapter with no condemnation, and he ends with no separation. We are that secure. We can be that certain. In a few minutes, we're going to sing A Debtor to Mercy Alone, which is an old hymn, but to a new tune that was written by Sam Kimsey. And all the words of that hymn are great, but pay particular attention to the third verse. In fact, it's hymn 463 if you want to go and open. I'm going to look at that for a moment. The tune isn't what we'll sing in a moment, but the words are the same. My name from the palms of his hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart, it, my name, remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I, to the end, shall endure as sure as the earnest is given. And earnest there should actually be capitalized because that's a reference to Jesus. He's the earnest. As sure as the earnest is given. More happy, but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. That is, those saints who are already with Jesus, they're more happy, yes, but they are still no more secure than we are right now. That's how secure we are in the Spirit. You might wonder why I keep saying in the Spirit, because he's not mentioned in this part of the passage, which indeed he's not. But he is the very one who persuades us of this truth. When Paul says, I am sure, in verse 38, that's because the Spirit has persuaded his heart and made that truth real to him, as he talks about earlier in chapter 8, and then he talks about again in chapter 9. Because that's the Spirit's primary job to take the truth and the work of Christ and make it real to us, to apply it to our lives, to sink it down deep into our hearts, to enthrall us with Christ and the love of the Father, all with the end of knowing that we can never, ever be separated from his love. And you know, if that's his primary work, it shows us that it's also our primary problem that we doubt this great love, are not truly persuaded of the great love of the Father. That's why we feel like we have to be in control or have to be right or have to be popular or have to be the center of attention or have to make the best grades or have to please others or have to have that thing we so desperately want or have to look competent before others or have to feel like we have it all together, have to win, any of those things, all of them. We look to those things in attempts to fill our hearts with something that only the love of God can actually fill. And only the Spirit can make that love truly real to our souls. So these are the truths that the Spirit persuaded Paul of. And he knows that we need to be persuaded of them so that we can say like him, I am sure. And look, if you're not, do continue to go back to God's word. Do keep coming back here for worship. Do pray. Don't give up on those things because those are all the things that the Spirit uses to persuade us and to give us that assurance of his truth. Yet we also must pray and ask the Spirit to make those things real to us because only he can do that. We can't do that part of it. We must pray and trust his work and his control and his timing in all of that. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you that nothing can separate us from your love, that neither death nor life nor anything else in all of creation can do that. Father, I pray that that security, that you would use that and you would work that love deep into our hearts by the work of the Spirit 
So we are fully convinced and persuaded of that truth and are strengthened by it to 